thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm John Hindi. I will be your presenter today. You know, thank you very much, Artika. And um, today we're going to be talking a little bit about how we're going to build a career in incident response and breach assessment. What we want to cover in this session is an overview of what incident response is, some of the purposes, definitions, and so on. And I will be sharing a little bit of practical experience in terms of what we would do uh, as a 101 and other exercises during an incident. Um, things like, as you see here, your communication strategy, war room activities, and so on. And um, sort of a response and accountability matrix um, aligned to RACI, of course, that I have seen work well during an incident response program or investigation. So as we get going with this session, what I wanted to start with was an introduction um, on incident response and share some quick facts as we see it today. The number one challenge during the entire cybersecurity process or within an investigation is incident response. And when I say the number one challenge, um, that would be scoping that incident itself. We have seen that critical parts of an incident response take care uh, within the first 24 hours of any incident report and as we start moving through the incident response process. Quite a few of our peers and leaders within cybersecurity tend to agree that we need to move very quickly but carefully during that process. Incident response uh, data is not shared as it should be within business partners and so on. And sometimes there are many reasons, right? Sometimes um, an executive may be um, wanting to find more data, more analysis before he or she shares with partners or the complexity of the incident response or the business they're in, you know, lends towards being a little more um, secure, security minded about it. So what we have seen in industry is 31% of organizations experience less than one incident per month, 10%, 500 or more. And one of the challenges that most of us have faced and we have discussed is the gaps in technological support, especially when it comes to responding to incident, incidents that occurs. Now we are seeing you know, challenges with this aspect of the business more and more as the complexity of attacks are uh, just getting uh, larger and larger. And when we start factoring things like ransomware attacks and how ransomware could have similar processes like the cyber kill chain, we need to formalize how we respond to in incidents where ransomware is involved in a more tactical manner, leveraging what we already know, of course. So one of the key things we hear in industry is that organizations lack dedicated staff. Um, some organizations have started cross-training programs, um, and we can only see the need for staff with specific skills in IR growing over time. So the first question myself as a hiring manager, you know, when I talk to graduating students or professionals looking to get into cybersecurity and folks who are already in cyber who want to specialize more in incident responses, are you sure? Are you sure you want to do this? Um, personally, I think incident response is fascinating for anyone with an analytical mind, um, especially if you already have that background of doing metadata analysis or working within a SOC or bug bounty hunting and so on. But the, the key thing to keep in mind is that every incident is, is unique. 
And we always have to keep that mindset of risk reward. And when I say risk reward, what is the impact of a specific risk that occurs as a result of an incident within an organization? How do we measure that risk impact? How do we quantitatively measure that impact um, across several areas of an organization rather than sticking with a siloed approach or you know segment by segment approach. Um, the analysts that I have seen successful think very quickly and it's very key in incident response to stay calm. Um, at the end of the day, incident response are getting closer and closer tied to digital forensics. So we have to keep in mind when we think about digital forensics, the ultimate aim is if data and reporting from a forensics perspective has to be presented in a court of law, that data, that evidence has to be irrefutable. So we have to keep in mind that mistakes are something we cannot afford to make. We have to be measured, we have to be insightful, we have to be collaborative and so on. And think about multiple scenarios when we're working through an investigation and then in turn collate that to provide an unbiased focus report. The thing is, as I have said, every incident is unique or Let's break that down a little bit further. Every incident could be a subset of another incident of vulnerability, sorry, vulnerability that occurred over time that another attacker may have compounded on top of that original vulnerability and then executed on that, making it a little more complex than the original vulnerability. So what we need to understand is tool sets, right? Uh, updates and collaboration. We have to be able to work with external vendors, auditors, and law enforcement. Uh, during an incident, we have to have that committee that comes in where we can share information. One of the key drawbacks I see during incident response is security tends to want to be a little secretive, whole, what's going on to their, their chest. So now, in IR, you have to be secretive, but that does not mean, and, and secretive during the investigation, right? But that does not mean that the steering committee that comprises of uh, select vendors, uh, subject matter experts, maybe external legal um, guidance, external auditors, um, together with the internal legal and audit teams, that doesn't mean that they should be precluded from updates. Um, we don't ever want to be in a position where we have, you know, external contracted legal counsel or enforcement in a room for a briefing and our internal legal audit um, and CXO leaders are now getting briefed or getting an update. Now, one of the key things for any investigation is to think outcome, right? We need to be able to understand how to meet expectations as we go through the incident response process and ensure, like I mentioned earlier, that we align with the forensic team. So for the newbies, I know on this call, we probably have a range of folks who have been in cyber for a while, who have been through security investigations. Um, you know, so this probably would be things you already know, but for the new folks or the folks, you know, getting further into IR, what we have seen you know, is specific definitions, right? We are part of EC Council's university. So an attack or breach can affect customers, intellectual property, and brand value. So the objective for any program is to ensure that we reduce risk impact and recover quickly and efficiently. 
So thus, incident response is a methodology that we will use to respond to and manage a cyber attack. That consists also of ensuring we have the right investigative processes and teams in order to learn from an attack. Um, sometimes we, we, we recognize an attack pattern and we can take that lessons from an attack pattern to bring forward to a current process in place. So the key thing is having an understanding of techniques, tactics, and protocols as we look at attack parts and ensure that we can develop a repeatable incident response plan. We don't ever want to have to be scrambling every time an incident occurs uh, to decide how, who is doing what, and essentially, how are we going to proceed? So this special publication 861 talks about the incident life cycle, you know, and obviously this is something that uh, it's, it's a in the international, it's a national body, sorry, in U.S. national body. Um, but from an international perspective, we all follow somewhat of a similar process, right? From preparation, detection, and analysis, containment, eradication, and and very important, our post-incident activity lessons learned and process changes we had to make during an incident response program. From an international perspective, you know, up on the screen here, I'm sharing um, ISO 27035. Uh, with its specific segments that talks about incident response from the principles of incident management to guidelines uh, as we plan and prepare and then guidelines for incident response operations. So I know when we get into IR, everyone wants to play with the tools. They want to show their expertise in running testing and analytics, as well as, you know, looking at metadata and pattern flows and so on. However, before we do anything, the basics of security is, you know, you always start with a policy. Your policy guides a process which governs an implementation. And the same way when it comes to incident response, we must have to be aligned with an organization's security policy. So I personally feel, as well as several of my other colleagues in this business, that incident response is heavily dependent on an organization's security policy. And what that means is if we don't have a robust enough policy, then we will have gaps. So what does the policy include? We must have acceptable use with participants, members of the technology and the IT team, signing an understanding of this and the recommendation of biannual recertification. We must show details on traffic monitoring and we see why we engage with this and and we also have that clarity that all business transactions are subject to monitoring and review again per policy within that policy as well we want to ensure that our security point of contact is clearly identified and we have clear definitions on users responsibility as they use company assets and conduct business on behalf of the company with related transactions of course security is not security without clearly defined training and education programs and a good to have is clarity around this as well and a process for the proper dissemination when it comes to lessons learned, training, and so on. Now, policies are all well and good, 
But one of the key challenges I have seen when I've switched to organization is finding the policies um, which may be buried you know, within a SharePoint site where you have to drill down and sift through to find such policy. Now, what I have seen work successfully in a lot of organizations is easy step to get to that policy and an easy process for individuals to access the policy with a read and sign acceptance portion. So, when we push back towards IR itself, you know, what is clear is an incident response model can be central, distributed, or coordinating. And some of the staffing models that I've seen work are with direct employees and sometimes as mentioned earlier some institutions some entities may not have the expertise in house that they need so we do see some outsourcing right we all know that in business so now let's talk a little bit about the incidents right types of incidents and you know we're going to pick up the pace a little bit um, we all have heard of malicious software and we know they are typically hidden within systems with the potential to replicate. Um, malicious software, you know, can be used for command and control, monitoring system, and looking at providing with CI command and control access. Now, what we have also spent time looking at with incidents when it when it aligns to, or as it aligns to incident response, is unauthorized access and privilege escalation, unauthorized services utilization, information stealing, um, utilizing ISPs, um, email monitoring and phishing, and, and we all know email monitoring, manipulation and phishing is a big deal today. Um, and of course, the standard probes and tunnel that we have seen for over a decade when it comes to you know attacks against entities. And lately, with ransomware, we are seeing that uptick in you know data copying as folks look to lock systems down. So, scenario-based incident response is something I wanted to touch on, as when we think about incident response, we don't want to be too rigid, especially in today's dynamic world, dynamic dynamic attack parts and so on. So we have seen that the former traditional incident response plans, sorry, tend to come across a bit rigid. Um, incident response plan as a rule should span, right? It should span data, application, host, internal network parameters, and for me, identity management, um, as, as well as for everyone. Now, we have to map the policies and process, and we have to align with our vendors and partners, and in today's cloud-ready world, we have to make sure we have allowances for those in addition to the aspects of physical security. Attackers today are very well trained and highly funded. So making attacks on organizations now is somewhat of a job. And when we think about scenario-based responses, we have to focus on organization-specific scenarios, sorry, working closely with our SOC, our CERT, and other representatives within security incident and operations get information we need as we analyze data post um, an incident occurring. The whole thing to keep in mind is how do we ensure that minimized impact to any organization that we're working with? How do we recover quickly and efficiently? How do we secure our systems? How do we ensure audit has the right reports they need and we are presenting the right IR reviews to meet that scenario and we of course learn what's going on, distribute those lessons learned and secure and store evidence and notes as we move into the forensics aspects of the business. War room activities are a key part of incident response and we have a process where communication, coordination, investigation, and escalation are our four 
pillars of incident response. Now, war room is a very secure area, as we all know. And this is, as they would say, a need to know. So only specifically selected and authorized members should be allowed within a war room. Communications have to be very secure between folks in an incident. And um, basically what we want to do is ensure that that's not shared with the general IT users within the environment. I have seen hybrid coming up in the marketplace from a war room, combination of physical and virtual, sorry, as we have spread teams. But the whole thing to keep in mind for successful war room activities is to maintain that structure, organization, and clearly define rules of engagement to drive the kind of decisions we need to make on the, this high pressure scenario. So what, what do we expect from incident response? As I said, minimizing impact. How did it happen? What were the attackers targeting? When we recover, what controls should have been in place that would have prevented an intrusion from occurring? When we think about secure, are there specific areas within our organizational security that will require additional resources or funding to minimize risk impact, minimize threats, and support the team in place so that they're not spread too thin. Um, key to all of this from an incident response perspective, though, is that executive briefing and investigative reports. That drives how successful we present our findings to law enforcement and, of course, to the board of directors and potential third parties and media if we have to get to that position. So some best practices from an incident response perspective, as I mentioned, securing IR communication prevents snooping through messages. Or if we still have an incident ongoing, we will not want to alert the potential malicious actors of any investigations going on on their actions. Um, we have to ensure coordinated system shutdown, again, so that attackers would not be no notified. We have to ensure that domain admin credentials are not used during a state of breach, and we're not executing tools that are not vetted and authorized by the IR2 team, sorry, um, on any impact in the systems. We don't want any overwriting occurring, right? And the master file table. And all volatile data and critical assets must leverage forensics tools. And of course, data, data, data is king. So we have to collect as much data as we need or we can find, sorry, um, from various areas within the environment and collate that for reporting. And then one thing I have seen as an after that worked well was developing a cybersecurity readiness scorecard and a heat map. User IDs and passwords that may have been compromised during the incident must be reset and we track that user IDs. Over here, this is a sample of a RACI matrix that I have used um, for my teams from an incident management perspective so that we drive communications, we ensure accountability, and we present the right information to leadership as needed during the course of an incident response program. So coming to the career aspects, companies hire incident response, because they want to stay away from loss due to cyber crimes. We have seen success with consultants. Um, however, the key thing for IR, as mentioned earlier on, is that hands-on aspect is really important. Um, I personally give hands-on experience more weight than um, certifications with no experience. Um, certifications, on the other hand, augmenting experience is a good thing. Um, personally, when we look for IR folks, 
I look for people coming out of a sock, for example, um, or a cert, and they're looking to transition. A degree, you know, we have we are seeing that shift. Practical experience, skills, certifications map to practical experience. Sometimes are taking, you know, giving some people an advantage over going through the traditional bachelor's and master's degree. However, having a bachelor's degree or master's in digital forensic or cybersecurity gives you, with no experience, gives you a very solid foundation upon which to move into a, a, a SOC as a level one analyst. Um, and then into a PCERT, CERT, and eventually into IR. It is key that when you're looking at incident response, you highlight the hard skills that you have. And why I say that is we all know that techniques, tactics, and protocols are getting more and more sophisticated. So we're no longer focusing on siloed specialty skills, right? From an IR perspective, while yes, we want to make sure that you have specific strong skill set in IR, you should be coming from a background that shows breadth of exposure to cybersecurity um, across operating systems, hardware, software, as well as network systems, familiarity with how data loss prevention works, how uh, endpoint detection and reaction should be, you know, how firewalling and so on works, how to configure policies within firewalls and DLP systems, for example, um, how to look at rule sets as they maybe migrate from one firewall vendor to another and how those settings are configured and so on and what could go wrong within those configurations that a potential hacker could take advantage of. Um, so being able to show and demonstrate use of system monitoring tools, uh, forensic software and e-discovery, as well as being able to understand programming language is very valuable to me. Some of my teams, you know, they're very versed with Python and Perl, so they can, they can write shell scripts on the fly, uh, run queries on the fly as they're doing their analytics. Um, we have folks that are very strong with pen testing tools. And, you know, basically they can look at raw data dumps and do analysis on that from any endpoint monitoring device and so on. But that aside, an IR person needs to be able to communicate, needs to be able to stay calm, and needs to be able to think outside the box. So soft skills are really, really key to the success of an, an IR individual thinking outside the box thinking about an app that could have occurred with a particular family of malware and how that could probably be modified um, leveraging your hard skills experience is something that will set you apart from the rest of the team being able to drive advanced analytics and show demonstrate problem solving is, is key so that you can whiteboard or basically do cross-reference and present reports in a manner that is concise. And of course, then being able to communicate the results of your thoughts and your investigations in a manner that meets the audience you're presenting to, be it law enforcement or an executive, is key. So what comprises successful IR teams on the whole? You know, I've said it during the course of this presentation, right? Communication, documentation, collaboration. This is key for successful teams with an IR. We have to think of ourselves as a unit and not as an individual. Um, successful IR teams ensure that we have a central repository for security communications. We have uh, skilled team members who can understand and review critical incident tickets, high critical or mid-level. 
um, they can step in and explain something to your help desk analyst and work with your level three SOC analysts. Um, they are versed in system support, application, and network auditing so that they can speak the language of third-party auditors doing investigations in tandem with legal and law enforcement. Training yourself, continual education is very key. Um, we're not always under fire and IR. We do have downtime, but that downtime should be spending time with your SOC folks, looking at um, bug bounty programs, you know, educating yourself on new CVEs and TWEs, new attack parts and patterns, and working in labs to simulate attacks yourself uh, as part of research. Um, always key is looking at new programs, looking at new platforms as they are released to market by different vendors and seeing how those platforms and programs can help make your IR job easier. So, most successful IR experts that I know have forensics analysis experience, memory and malware analysis. They're very good at threat intelligence and key to some of the folks that set themselves apart is how they write their technical documentation. So with that, I want to thank everyone for attending today. I want to thank the EC Council team for facilitating this, and we will open up for some questions.